my name is Seth Eisen, and I consider myself a transdisciplinary artist because I work between a lot of different mediums. Um, I'm going to move forward here a little bit just so you can see um, my inspiration for today's talk uh, is um, the project that I've been doing uh, since 2017 called Out of Sight. Um, I'm the artistic director of Aizen Presents, which is a theater company in San Francisco. And we work with a myriad of different kinds of artists and technical people uh, to bring these uh, queer histories to the street. And I'm going to tell you about those histories today. And I'm also going to tell you about just some of the methodologies that we use to, to bring those histories to life. Uh, so um, let's see here. Oh, I want to just show you that little gift. That's from our most recent um, walking tour uh, that uh, was in Golden Gate Park. And that's Tina D'Elia, who's portraying uh, hibiscus. So this is hibiscus over here on the right. And an inspiration for today, hibiscus was, if you remember uh, reading about the March on Washington in uh, the mid 60s, uh, which was a protest against the war, hibiscus was the person who was putting the daisy in the barrel of the gun of uh, the National Guard. And he then moved to San Francisco and started the gender bending performance troupe called the Coquettes. And here, Tina D'Elia is portraying, as you can see, hibiscus. So that's kind of like an inspiration for our, our talk today. So, so I'm just going to first introduce you to uh, some of my visual art. So went to art school. Uh, it felt very static to me, but there was a way that I was really exploring um images and color and symbols and trying to find really personal meaning in what was discarded i loved kind of like dumpster diving and uh, like looking at things that would normally be thrown away by others and trying to imbue meaning in them or find my own personal meaning in them so this is just a few images of of some early work um, that got really boring for me after a while um, when I finished art school and got really into dance and theater and went to Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, which was kind of a hotbed for experimentation around theater and dance. And it's interesting that you mentioned Anna Halperin because many of her students uh, actually came to Naropa from the 70s and 80s and developed the dance and theater program, as well as forms like contact improvisation um, really were developed there at Naropa. So um, these are some other images too of like kind of seeing some of the techniques that I use just as a metaphor for you to see. I'm not going to show you my entire portfolio, but um, that I use a lot of sewing in my work. Um, and, and that was for me, again, another metaphor, sort of stitching together uh, different ideas and disparate parts, but always kind of uh, leading me back to this, the question of identity and, and why my identity as a, as a queer person mattered. Uh, when I came to San Francisco, I was doing a lot of um, site-specific installation uh, and there was a lot of there were a lot of evictions in the early 90s when I moved here and we were doing protests on the street. Uh, we were, you know, doing them very visually, really getting in people's faces. There were performances happening. And what I was doing is just like making these installations and um, getting in people's faces in another way or just kind of trying to open up some of these ideas of like, look what's happening dancers group, which was one of the longest running dance um, studios in San Francisco was being shut down because of the dot com boom of the time. Um, as Susan said, uh, one of my um, influences were our embodiment practices, different kinds of somatics, and I was very involved with with Butoh, 
which is a modern form of Japanese dance uh, that's somewhere kind of a cross between uh, martial arts and, and modern dance. It's very elemental, uh, really gets into, uh, uh, kind of goes into metaphysical states and takes the dancer sort of into the body of say, the common people. Um, and it really comes out of the Second World War and the destruction of um, Japanese culture and sort of where people were at at that time. So it's really coming out of this sense of um, woundedness, but also kind of breaking the, the lines uh, with more, a more traditional aesthetic around, around dance and theater. There's more to, to learn about that if you're interested, but I staged a bunch of performances and was part of a number of different Butoh companies uh, in the Bay Area for about seven or eight years. This is one in which, um, again, I was inviting audiences into uh, a, a car lot that was um, in Oakland and making a piece about transportation and human interact interactions with with cars and traffic and lost car parts and did that through through performance so i'm um, trying to make the connection here too that i was starting to begin to see the connection between my visual art and the objects that i was making and the research that i was doing on queer culture and i began in the early 90s to learn about the more than 150 Native American uh, tribes that had a special place for people who didn't fit neatly into gender norms, now known as two-spirit people. How many people are familiar with that idea or concept? Yay. So, um, so this is a very interesting uh, idea to think that, wow, there were cultures, not just indigenous cultures in the Americas, but also all over the world and where, where queer people may have had a special place. And just that idea alone was really significant to me. And so I started to think about what would be my tool of persuasion, um, being a young kid who really loved to vacuum a lot. And I was trying to take that idea of like using using these kinds of tools um, that could reflect more of, again, who, who I am. <clears throat> so there's me uh, in an early um, iteration of a piece uh, called Twofold One Kind, which was my first play that I wrote in uh, 1993. Um, so uh, when I, again, uh, after my years of Buto, I started um, doing kind of a mix with contemporary dance and circus and was part of a company called Circo Zero, whose director is Keith Hennessy. And we made a lot of shows uh, that were very highly politicized, uh, really working with the politics of the moment and um, staging those both in San Francisco, but we also had a lot of residencies in Europe and toured there and also here in the US. That's me. <laughs> um, so it was like a weird, kind of thing I never really expected to go kind of like from buto dance and theater into like the world of circus so learning circus skills and also what it allowed me was this incredible opportunity to experiment and that was really um <clears throat> you know really brought forth by by Keith our director at the time to like okay you want to make a mask with video projections on it you want to use puppetry um, all of these things that I had desires to do that were, to me, connected to my performance work um, really was enabled uh, and encouraged uh, working with Circo Zero. So that, that really was another thing that really led to it. But, and just, this is, these are some examples. This was a, a bottle tree that I created um, for one of the circus shows. And then you can see here how it sort of became part of the this is me in the foreground. So the work I was doing was kind of sort of shamanistic, you know, kind of again groping for, you know, what is the shamanic cult, um, culture of queer people? You know, what is that? Like, you know, as a, as a white person, do I have permission to feel the affinities 
for all of these cultures that actually did respect queer people and and be kind of inserts through my art for for one of my own so that really has nothing to do with with the piece itself that we're looking at which is called mercy but um, again, this was an opportunity for me to bring my performance work together and really connect it with visual art to really create a visual spectacle. Uh, another uh, thing that I was doing um, after working with, with Circo Zero was uh, using puppetry, uh, which I think I'm going to be teaching a workshop here in puppetry January 28th, I want to say. Um, so if you're interested in, in puppetry and how I use puppetry, um, I'll be going into a lot of detail on that day about um, why puppetry, how to make puppets. Um, I have some really incredible pieces to show to share with you at that time. But just to give you a little flavor of the work that I've done, I was doing a lot of research um, around queer ancestors, uh, again, queer people who maybe whose histories were were more hidden or there wasn't a lot written about them, very interested in that. And then how to make those histories more visible through puppetry in performance. So this is a person named Tommy Isan Dorsey. Um, you might have heard of Maitri AIDS Hospice uh, in San Francisco uh, in the 1980s and 90s, people were dying. At a, at a really fast pace. And there, there was no dedicated hospice at the time that, um, you know, for queer people, especially. And uh, Isan Dorsey actually created the first one. This is him in the 1950s um, performing in drag in North Beach. Um, he was kind of a mess, but had this amazing performance troupe uh, with five people, they were pretty drugged out um, and touring across the US as drag queens, which was pretty dangerous in the 50s. So it was unusual that a troupe of five drag queens would be moving across the US and, uh, you know, going from club to club, uh, dealing with the oppression of, of their era. And unfortunately, they were in a tragic car accident and four of them died and Tommy actually lived. And uh, he then came back to San Francisco, got involved with the San Francisco Zen Center and later became the abbot of the San Francisco um, Hartford Street Zen Center. And then later created the Maitri AIDS Hospice in that building, it's still there. Um, on Hartford Street in the Castro, and it's connected to uh, the San Francisco Zen community. So he went from being a drag queen to being a, a Zen abbot and, you know, kicking his drug habit and uh, bringing a lot more stability into his life and then also being a leader uh, in the world of um, Zen, but also in, in caring for people with AIDS. So this is the puppet that I created um, for, for Tommy Dorsey. You can see him um, as the drag queen. And in this piece, he kind of strips down, does a song, um, and, and then, uh, whoops, and then becomes the sort of flips over. So it's the same puppet uh, that you can see is like one side of it is this drag queen, and then it really comes apart and transforms. So that was a really important piece for me because I, I realized that, wow, there's a, there is a connection between embodiment and disembodiment when a puppet can kind of come apart. There's a sort of intimacy that happens in puppetry that people really get to come close and see and feel uh, what another human might be experiencing. And so that was a real uh, turning point for me. So as a... Uh, uh, playwright and actor, one of the things I began to do when I started my company in 2007 was <clears throat> portray some characters from uh, queer history uh, that were unknown and movements. So this was a man whose name was Gene Mallon. Uh, he was um, part of what was called the pansy craze, 
which was a short lived moment in New York's history of queer history that there were sort of effeminate drag performers um, or sort of effeminate men who were the hosts of many clubs all over New York. So he was the first to start this and uh, got really into his history. He died really tragically in 1933. He was in a number of Hollywood films, including films with Mae West, and his credits were actually erased from the, uh, from the credits at the, at the end of the films that he was in until recently. So these histories were only more recently discovered in the, um, some of the research that George Chauncey historian did uh, around Jean Mallon and the pansy craze. So this was sort of my entrance into that. And now I'm gonna sort of take you into some of the, the, the tools and techniques that I use in my, in my work. So again, I bring circus in, um, live drawing, because that was something that's really appealing to me. So you actually see the artist on stage and the artist is drawing on say an overhead projector or some electronic device that's then either projected on the bodies of performers or onto a screen. <clears throat> uh, aerials was something that I learned um, in Circo Zero. And so these are some of the techniques that, I, that I've used, including the ones that I've mentioned like puppetry and so forth. And shadow puppetry is one that's been a, a real love of mine. Uh, in this particular piece, which was called Homophile, it was about a tattoo artist who lived here in Berkeley, he was actually from, originally from Chicago. Um, very famous uh, tattoo artist who recorded a lot of his sort of actual sexual exploits, again, in a time when you could be arrested for even admitting that you were homosexual. So this was a piece that I did, used a lot of live acting and um, silhouette work as well as shadow puppetry. Uh, so this is a, I'm gonna now just show you a tiny bit about some of my favorite um, pieces that I've, one favorite piece that I did uh, called Rainbow Logic, uh, arm in arm with Remy Sharlap. Remy Sharlap was a mentor of mine he was a, a dancer, a choreographer, and he was also a children's book illustrator. And this was sort of like a turning point for me. I was always very interested in, in research and archives, and I'm a total research geek. Um, put me in Bancroft Library and give me a box. I don't care what it is, and I get really happy. And this was an amazing opportunity, both being Remy was my mentor, and he became a friend. Uh, and he was really connected to, uh, again, another connection to Anna Halperin and that whole 1940s, 1950s dance and theater and art scene in New York, um, part of a very experimental scene. If you've ever heard of the, the choreographer Merce Cunningham and the composer John Cage, Remy was uh, the first male dancer in Cunningham's company. So he's really part of the uh, a very uh, important and experimental scene in New York. And so I got to know him here in the Bay Area. And then when he had a stroke in 2006, I started working with his archives and really organized those archives, turned it into a, a, some, a more cohesive body of work, and then placed those archives in two major institutions on the East Coast. So that's sort of like a, a part-time gig that I do on the side, which is my love and passion for, for archives. Um, after or during that somewhat into the project, uh, I, I realized that this would be really incredible material to include in a theater production. So uh, I used some of Remy's most famous books, Arm in Arm is one of them. Uh, Fortunately is another, if you're interested, you could look them up. Um, and I created a show that incorporated both his uh, children's books uh, and, and how he became a children's book author, as well as uh, some of his choreography. So he, like myself, was also a visual artist that went into the world of performance and dance. And one of the things he used to do was create these dances called airmail dances, in which he would draw the choreography 
and then mail them to an artist anywhere in the world. And they could then interpret those dances with their dance companies in any way they want. So it's a technique called page to stage. So this was the show that I created, uh, was built around three characters. Uh, one was the younger Remy, one was the older Remy, and, uh, and then a third person who played a number of different characters, women in, in Remy's life. So originally, this is just to kind of give you a sense of, with my indoor productions, before I started the out of sight work, how I sort of conceived of uh, a, a project like this in which I would both memorialize Remy's life, talk about his history uh, as a queer ancestor and, and uh, work with the different techniques that I'm using here. So you can see overhead projector. This was all in the idea phase, uh, projecting on a large book. Great idea, who knows if it'll work. And then maybe a smaller toy theater uh, stage, which toy theater is a tradition where you have a small little theater like this, and those uh, puppets move more uh, horizontally across the stage, uh, a small puppet stage that it's sort of a, it's in miniature. And then to create a puppet that, this is me, a puppeteer, uh, create a puppet that uh, would be made out of Remy's tools. So I usually start with really big lofty ideas and then uh, go through the creative process to see whether it's even possible. Um, we apply for grants and start to dream and work with, I assemble a team and then see kind of where that, where that takes us. This is my research assistant, Jim, who worked with me in Remy's archives. And you can see there were a lot of discoveries that we made um, as I was sort of organizing that and starting to do research on this project. I worked with a set designer who actually said, yeah, it's possible we could make a book, uh, a large book for the stage, and it would be in this scale next to the, the actors. Um, on one side, we created a scrim so you could project on the front, but also see some, some action behind it, as well as video projections on, on one side of it. And then here is um, the, the piece uh, in actuality. So, here we have um, the toy theater in the front um, with the very tiny puppets. I'll show you details of those. Um, you can see the three actors here. This is a tech person running a camera that actually points right into the toy theater. And then what's inside the toy theater is then projected on this very large book here. I'll show you a couple more images of that uh, in a moment. So this is just pictures of Remy. Um, and the composer Lou Harrison, who was his boyfriend at the time, very important composer of the early mid 20th century. Um, they had this incredible relationship where they were writing letters to one another. And when I discovered those letters, um, just the letters themselves, like the envelopes um, addressed from one to the other, Remy was teaching Lou um, calligraphy and Lou was then working at Black Mountain College. Another thing you should write down and read about a very innovative uh, school on the East Coast that no longer exists. And just reading the, the letters to one another was really fascinating to me of like, wow, these are like little jewels. How do I then incorporate these into, into the work itself? So here you can kind of see how the scrim is used here. This is, um, talking about their very first meeting where Remy is calling up to the window going, hey, do you know where the dance department is? And Lou is just in the mirror shaving. It's a story Remy told. So I take some of these disparate pieces and stories and weave them together into, into the narrative. So these are some of the actors there. Um, there's some pictures just, just for curiosity. This is Merce Cunningham. This is Remy on the right. Um, no, on the, yeah, on the right, and Carolyn Brown, one of um, Merce's uh, longest running dancers, uh, Carolyn Brown. That's John Cage, there's Remy uh, on the ladder there. And then these are the puppets, these are the toy theater puppets that we created uh, <clears throat> in for the toy theater that would then be projected on that book. So you can see um, here is Remy and here is John Cage. 
And then this is an, one of my favorite techniques, which is using the toy theater as this famous uh, VW bus that John Cage actually won in a, <laughs> on a, uh, a game show in Italy. Uh, and this is how they would tour across the US was in this VW bus. So you can see this is a live hand projected holding the little bus and it kind of moves as a, as a VW bus would with uh, one of the actors playing Don Cage and the other playing Remy uh, in the front of the bus. So very fun scene. I'm gonna skip through these quickly, but just so you can kind of see, uh, these are some things that I found in Remy's archive. I was really focusing on Remy as a very young person and Remy as an older person. And I couldn't quite locate uh, who was that person in between? And um, was that, what was Remy like? There wasn't a lot written about or journaled about what Remy was like as a middle-aged person. So I was really curious about that. And this is one way that I've worked with archives is that literally went in randomly one day, opened up a box of journals, opened it up to this page where Remy is actually writing about his younger self and his older self and his middle-aged self in between um, and how they kind of came together. So that um, talks a little bit about how I incorporate that into the work itself of like these moments of discovery in an archive. Sometimes it's based on an image, sometimes it's based on a story, part of the narrative and figuring out how to weave that in and have it make visual sense. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the Out of Sight project and talk to you a little bit about uh, my inspiration. Um, <clears throat> so this is, you can look this up on the web and I actually have a reading list for all of you if you're interested in reading any articles about this, books and so forth, some of the research that I've done for this particular project Out of Sight. So um, in 2016, I think this, document was published. It's called the Citywide Historic Context Statement for LGBTQ History in San Francisco. It was part of a project um, endowed by the National Park Service during the Obama administration to bring more queer histories to life and do in, you know, uh, a pretty in-depth study of several cities around the country. So I got to meet uh, the, the two women who created this, uh, Shane Watson and Donna Reeves, who are local historians. I don't know if you know. If you... Donna Reeves was the best on Okay, I had a feeling, because um, both of them are pretty amazing. When I, when I got my hands on this document, it was life-changing, because basically it was like all of this history that's not normally visible. Uh, going back to, you know, San Francisco when it was, it is still um, Yalamu uh, and the Ohlone people were, were really here before colonialism. And so, you know, and like just then going forward into history and dozens of histories that I'd never heard of. And they were really connected both to, to buildings, to place. And they were, the histories were also connected to specific neighborhoods. So I started to imagine uh, in the sort of central vision of this piece of uh, answering a need of, and, and reading about the fact that there was a lack of public awareness of queer histories in San Francisco. And mostly what I imagined in my maybe grumpy side that this would lead to was just a lot more plaques around the city. So 90% of the plaques I learned, 90 plus percent of the plaques around San Francisco are not about queer history. And so I thought to myself, what if you could actually go to a neighborhood and actually see the histories performed for you live? What if you could be immersed by those histories? So I was thinking about the appealing to the public's ability to hold collective memory by seeing those histories live and the you know the possibility of bringing those histories and queer cultural heritage to life and and made visible and the other idea too is like thinking about just all of the sort of 
shifting landscapes that I've seen in the Bay Area since living here for 26 years of like, oh my God, like so many layers of people that I knew that moved away and, and how the landscape, the social landscape of the city has really changed, especially in the queer community. So our answer to this was take it to the streets. And that's how the Out of Sight project began. Uh oh, what's happening? So um, this brought up the question for me, how can historians and preservationists ensure representation of LGBTQ plus communities? And the solution that I had was an artist led project that incorporated research as an integral part of the artistic process. And so on the first out of sight tour, which I'm gonna show you in a moment, uh, this is basically what we did was we brought 40 some histories to life uh, in North Beach in our first round of out of sight. I'll talk about why that was problematic later, um, but you can see each one of these uh, people here painted, it represents one of the 30 some characters that we portrayed in the show. Uh, and that was our first show. And then in 2019, we did research for our uh, out of sight Soma show that uh, was then uh, whittled down to only six performers. So we started with 14 and then we got it down to, can we do the same thing with six performers? Uh, then in 2020, we did it online, did it with three performers. And this past year, Susan, I believe you saw that show, um, had one performer. So I'll talk to you about the differences between that and the, the choices that uh, we made to, to move um, in that direction of having it be uh, a little bit more uh, streamlined. So again, the inspiration was historic context statement. I talked to you about the plaques uh and the possibility of what if we could bring that and then i wanted to just tell you about the intended audience of like history buffs you know you don't necessarily have to be a queer person it makes me really happy that non-queer people come and learn about not only the city but um the queer presence in different neighborhoods like north beach that was that that used to have a you know many queer bars um since the turn of the century um, even before, I mean, uh, when it was when Barbary Coast into North Beach, uh, you know, in the in the 19th century was another kind of hangout for then not known as gay people, but um, for for a queer presence. Uh, also, you know, tourists, uh, adults of all ages, anyone interested in hidden histories. Mm, uh, or anyone interested in oppressed minority histories and anyone interested in helping us to disseminate these histories. So we've learned a lot about who was actually interested in these shows versus the shows that we were doing uh, in theaters. And then Melody actually asked me to talk a tiny bit about funding, uh, like how do we get funding for these? It's like one of my least favorite things, but it's a, a necessary end uh, to, to find funding. And there, you know, there are sources we get national and uh, local foundation grants. Uh, we're supported by the city and the state uh, for our different projects. Uh, we, we have individual donors that we've cultivated over a number of years and corporate sponsors sometimes, but not the corporate ones you're thinking about. We haven't gotten funding from any of those yet. And then earned in income from ticket sales. So hopefully that's helpful to you. So now I'm going to show you um, the promo, just so you can get a, a little taste uh, of the first uh, out of sight. Should we cut the lights or what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can hit the lights. Thank you. Let's see here. So these are just some other um, flyers for uh, the next shows that we did. We did one in South of Market. Um, and now I'm just going to talk to you a tiny bit about um, what these uh, projects have in common in terms of their method, style, uh, place and impact, and also uh, 
talk about some artistic strategies that we use. So this is an iterative process, meaning that we do a lot of versions of these tours before you know, we get to put together a 14 person show. Um, we work with a big team, usually between 25 and 40 artists on one of these projects. The writers, researchers, performers, composers, technicians, and crew. Um, the work is immersive and site responsive. I'll talk a little bit more about that and how we uh, scout locations and so forth and find out how to interact with the space itself. Uh, they're all uh, often based on oral histories that I and uh, my collaborators conduct. And that's a really crucial component of the work because it's how to incorporate the voices of people from the neighborhoods. And um, the mapping that we do um, is, is another really crucial piece to figure out, you know, again, scouting these really interesting spaces and then also talking to people of the neighborhood uh, as, as the, you know, culture bearers. Storyboarding uh, is, is a, an aspect of the work that's, that's really crucial because the work is really modular or it had been up until this, this past year's show in the sense that, that each of those scenes and characters is one kind of mini play in and of itself. So it could be put together in any order going, moving across time and space. Uh, there's again interactivity with the spaces and the audiences, not just moving them or ushering them from one place to the other, but really giving them a, a lived experience of the history. And then there's negotiating with the elements of time, space, and weather. Like you hear the rain outside, and it's like, you know, you might have to order a hundred umbrellas to deal with it, or cancel a show, or um, how do you get an audience of a hundred people? split in half and then split in half again and then how do you weave those those uh, ideas together um so uh artistic strategy number one i'd say archival images are something that i really use as a tool to kind of build a picture of queer past so literally like you know either on the internet or going into archives and just getting curious about any particular uh, you know, image and like, what is that story behind that? Who are those people? Um, you know, what, what were they doing? What were their lives like? And the idea is the goal is being, uh, creating a living archive uh, or in, in, uh, in, in a visible archive um, through performance. This is, a, um, I actually heard about Future Histories Lab through this artist. Um, Janet Delaney, she's a photographer, and in our North Beach um, show, this is a perfect example of how images from archives or exhibitions might inspire the work. So I, I opened up a book of her, of her photographs of South of Market in the 70s and 80s, and I was really blown away. I was like, there's something going on here. Like, what is this about? Um, so this uh, was a worker at an all-women owned and operated auto repair shop. It was the only one of its kind. There were articles in Vogue magazine um, when this happened uh, in the in the 80s, 70s and 80s. I think it opened in 77. Um, and yeah, they were, you know, this woman, Nancy Ruprecht, actually trained uh, many people to come by there. So we went to, you know, look at the space itself, um, see more pictures of Janet, um, of who some of the neighbors might have been in the neighborhood. There was a coffin builder on one side. Um, there were um, sewing houses on another. And then we staged this performance um, with uh, Marga Gomez, well-known Bay Area performer and uh, comedian, uh, and Landa Lakes uh, in a scene that, that, we, that I wrote based on, which I didn't write that, this, that piece was written by Carl Sonline. Um, a local writer, and but I interviewed Nancy Ruprecht, who was the owner of Labrys Auto Care, and from the interview, uh, Carl was able to write um, this this particular scene. And this was a photograph that Nancy gave to me uh, of her, you know, working on a car there uh, in the in the late seventies. So again, you know. The tactic of, you know, is it going to be a, a plaque? This is from the Rainbow Walk in the Castor. If you haven't gone by there, there's some amazing histories 
plaques are really quite beautiful. They're large. Um, they really give you a sense of like who this person might have been. You can do your own research. Um, but our tactic again was really bringing that person, Sylvester, right to the street, stopping traffic right outside Scientology in North Beach, um, really making quite a spectacle. Um, so performance strategy number two is performance versus plaques. Um, number three would be uh, exploring queer history as living archives of people in place, interrogating uh, the buried or lost layers, shifting landscape and geographies. How do we deal with the history of genocide by naming them? Um, and also having indigenous people tell the stories of, of land rights, connecting to the history um, of the place, um, connecting the history of place to xenophobia, race, homophobia, policing of gender, sexuality, and disability. And so this, I, I, this is just an example of kind of like images that reflect the different layers. So here is a, a depiction of the Ohlone people. Here is an old map. Uh, here is a building called uh, the Monkey Block that no longer exists in North Beach where we were doing research. And then here's the Trans America building that sits on top of that uh, site where the Monkey Block once was. And then uh, here are, uh, here's an Ohlone leader um, who was doing a ritual for one of our performances and Land Lakes um, who is another indigenous leader who was part of our part of our shows that you saw in that in that video. So this is kind of how we bring those histories and sort of weave them together. Um, another artistic strategy is sort of pairing the histories and social geographies um, when the sites don't exactly match um, or no longer exist. And there's tons of questions around these this idea of um, whether the story should take the lead or the really cool venue we find that takes the lead and can you mix and match those. So this was another thing and just to give you an example of how complicated the mapping of this is, is like this was for our North Beach tour, you know, and, you know, going to scout these locations and going, okay, well, the audience is going to meet um, here <laughs> and then the two groups are going to go are going to split in half and some are going to go here some are going to go here and then there's two parts to this and then you know like this is a really amazing spot and then this is a really amazing spot and then we're all going to meet back here and then we're going to move everyone to this final location and but then there's like there's all these layers of like what you don't want to miss like this image from a lesbian bar in north beach and then do if just taking people there, tell the history, how much of the history do you actually need to tell people? And then what do you include in a program? And then there's just the, the presence of the performers actually just being on site and there's maybe not as much you need to really tell. So again, sort of showing versus telling. Um, in our South of Market tour, we were working with Ringgold Alley um, that was central to the gay cruising scene in the 70s and um, was a kind of original spot for the Up Your Alley Fair. And it basically, you know, with all of the sort of gentrification of that area kind of disappeared. And then some people worked with an architect in the area. I don't know if you know about this project, but it's, it's do you know about this project? No? Um, it's pretty cool. They, they work with artists, historians of the neighborhood to basically um, create a memorial using um, uh, sidewalk curbs to talk about the different histories of that, of that neighborhood. And then here's us bringing the performance to the street. So you get kind of a little bit of both, some of the plaques and then some of us bringing those histories to life. Uh, another strategy is um, bringing uh, the non-extant spaces to life through the oral histories, speaking with people who lived um, uh, or spent time in those spaces, just uh, finding and deciphering artwork that has a, a direct connection to the history and reimagining the spaces with digital tools, artwork and photography. And this is a kind of a favorite um, story of mine 
Um, this was an article that came out. Again, we're talking about our South of Market tour. This is an article that came out in 1964 that uh, was called Homosexuality in America. It was a really seminal article that was really kind of going, well, I'll read you from the article. These brawny young men in their leather caps, jackets, and pants are practicing homosexuals, men who turn to other men for affection and sexual satisfaction. Homosexuals are openly admitting, even flaunting their deviation. Um, and I think something like 40 years later, they made a public apology in Life magazine uh, for this article that was pretty discriminating against queer community. Um, that um, article, the, the photographs in that article were um, taken inside of this bar, which was the first leather bar south of market, and it had a, a mural in this bar that that mural and the building were destroyed. I met um, Mike Caffey um, and did an oral history here who shared a lot of the artwork from that era. He was in his 20s then, he's in his 80s now. Um, he shared a lot of histories with me of the space. Um, that space is now the Whole Foods at 4th and Harrison in San Francisco. And this is one of the ways that we used Mike's artwork to reimagine this building that no longer exists. Mike actually drew, uh, he actually made a maquette, which I fell in love with, that allows you to visualize what it looked like in the bar, because there's only like written descriptions of it. But um, so we use that maquette as uh, for our online show that we did um, as the background for, for those scenes. Um, so it's really key in this, um, in this work that who is telling this, who is telling the actual story. So this is a, um, an image of the Black Hat Cafe, which was once a real bohemian spot in North Beach and the place where Jose Saria uh, was the, um, the MC and host uh, was one of the most bohemian spots in, in the world. Uh, at, that, at that time, people came from all over um, to see Jose and Jose was one of the people that sort of won the rights for gay people to actually gather in public and to have any kind of physical contact in public. And so this is Jose there back in the day in the, in the 60s. And then this is Landa Lakes portraying him right there at the site. So you can kind of get a sense. Same with uh, Gladys Bentley, uh, who you saw in the video, uh, who was a, a, a well-known singer, came from um, New York and LA um, performed at Mona's Club in North Beach and was then uh, performed by Lisa Evans. So um, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, uh, this is a fun story. <laughs> this is a, a, a magazine we discovered in North Beach that was basically how to sin in San Francisco and you could take a gray line bus tour um, and tour all of the gay clubs in North Beach. Uh, so, um, let's see. Do you, do you guys have any questions just, just where we're at right now? Because I know we're going to end in a few minutes and I want to make sure I leave time for that. Anything that's occurring to you? There's probably a lot. I've been talking for a while. Yes? No, that's not a hand up. There's an almost. There's probably so much that it's maybe overwhelming. So are, are yeah. Um, I'm sort of pausing. Well, I'm kind of getting a feel for where you guys are at. If you, ha if you have a lot of any, any pressing questions, I'm happy to move into that. Yeah. So there's an only half of the about the minutes left. Yeah. So I think, I think uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's good. I mean, I can show more stuff and and talk more, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. 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 Sure, yeah. Um, well, you saw the puppets that I, I mean, I use a lot of different kinds 
of puppetry. In the walking tours, it's a, it's a lot more tricky. But objects become puppets, right? And it becomes sort of object manipulation, moving them as you would sort of puppet something, right? So it could be something connected to the actual place that we use. Um, I don't know if you saw in that video, um, one of the histories we were portraying was the urinal, right? With the two little hand puppets in it. So that's a kind of crude um, puppeting that we did in these tours. But uh, the puppets can be like the one I showed you of Remy Charlotte that are like really elaborate um, Boon Raku style puppets, um, or they could be the shadow puppets or they could be the toy theater puppets. So all of those. Um, and you know, what I've learned is that, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily to people how, um, you know, masterfully those are, are built. Uh, it's more about how they really create the space for telling the, telling the story. So you could literally, you know, use a water bottle as a puppet. And, you know, if you have a good story to tell, this bottle could really be a great stand in for, for some piece of history. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And again, we'll be, we'll be doing a workshop in January that I would love to share more about how you could, if you're interested in puppetry, how you could make really simple puppets. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Huh. Um, well, I think, like I said, with one of the strategies is really is collaborators. I'm not going to tell the story of indigenous people, but I'm definitely going to going to create opportunities for indigenous people to talk about and to tell their own stories within the context of the work. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, I think as, as a, a white led organization i think it's really important for me to raise the voices of q bipoc artists and histories um so within my ability that's really what i've what i've worked to do does that answer your question yeah yes Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. Uh, I'm just gonna maybe show you show you this image here. Let's see. So this is um, Peggy Caserta in our most recent tour. In this particular tour, um, she was the inventor of bell-bottom jeans. She was friends with Janis Joplin. And uh, the store that she originally owned uh, was the site of the, the location that we, that we actually uh, created the tour at. So that was a kind of perfect match. Um, but, you know, and this is uh, what it looked like before. This is what it looked like when we came to it, to the storefront. But, you know, in actuality, I'm gonna tell you a small secret that the place that we actually did the show was one door down from where the history happened. And so, does it matter? Audiences don't really care. You're really in the location. We're on the actual cement where Peggy was and where all that happened. Another, uh, another example, um, is that in North Beach, in the North Beach tour, there were so many incredible spots. And then the histories are really, were really important. We worked a lot with Shaping San Francisco. I don't know if you all know them, shapingsf.org. Um, they've been our community partner in this project. They do a lot of uh, walking tours, biking tours, and have a whole online presence around subversive history, histories around the Bay Area. And one thing that I learned from them was um, 
find a good location and then just tell your story there. Um, let the location take the lead. And I was always like on the edge of that, but I realized that it actually did make a difference. So for example, in that video I showed you, you saw there was a transgender man in a, um, in this really dark, dingy um, hallway. And that was um, a spot we found uh, in North Beach that was definitely not where the histories happened, but it was connected to the histories and it was an amazing spot. So also, you know, another, another thing is we've taken some of these tours to college campuses and you can't, you know, you can pretend that, you know, you're at, at the Black Hat Cafe, but you're not at the Black Hat Cafe. But in theater, um, you know, there's that, there's that thing of disbelief, you know, and people will go along for the ride. You know, it's the same thing kind of with puppetry is like, as long as you're like saying, okay, here we are, and we're experiencing this thing here, it doesn't really matter where we are in some ways. And in another way, it, it was absolutely really moving for us to, um, to actually spend time in, you know, in the building where Peggy Caserta had been um, and to actually have her really tell the histories of not only what it was like at her store, um, and that she was really part of the rock and roll ballroom scene, but, but to just be in the neighborhood um, where she used to hang out. And I think that's, that's more part of it, that the presence of the ancestor isn't necessarily located in one place, but it's kind of like, we think about it, the, the wider perspective of a neighborhood itself. So yeah, build structures, it's just always this conversation about you know, extant spaces versus non-extant spaces. And, you know, how do, how do you work with that? How do you create that, that environment, you know, for, for telling the history? Does that answer the, the question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, mostly it was led by where the histories have disappeared. And North Beach seemed obvious. It's also just a neighborhood I've always really loved. And then, you know, I just, I read a lot, like, well, I go, how many histories are there in this neighborhood? So North Beach just had so many of them. Like, there were way too many to put into a show, and we probably put too many in there. Um, people seem to have a really good experience, but when we did our more focused tour with one actor and two histories, people had more of an ability to digest that, I think, more than uh, they did with the sprawling thing. So that's part of it is like, there were a lot of great locations there. There were a lot of great histories. Um, I've also did a Tenderloin tour. It's just much more difficult. Um, so for different reasons, there's a lot of factors to take into consideration. Um, you know, one is safety of the audiences and safety of the performers and, you know, where are we rehearsing, you know, how do you move about, how do you also, I mean, an, another issue that, that comes up is how do you interface with, um, with people who are living, who are houseless and who are living on the streets and, and how can you help? Um, versus like, oh, we're setting up shop here, so this is now our territory. So it's it's very tricky. Um, so that's how is you know nor, uh, with South of Market, you know, you know that the year we did the show was like just several months before the famous stud bar closed. Uh, we we told a whole history about about that bar, but many other bars that no longer exist. So those histories are really disappearing. Same thing in, in Haight. Uh, there were seven gay bars, uh, gay and lesbian bars in that neighborhood. There is now one. Um, why the bars are central is because those were the legal gathering spots for queer people in those days. Are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at this at this point, we're looking, um, you know, we've been building up for a number of years, um, uh, trying to figure out what the right 
<laughs> the right number of people is. Um, and with this particular tour, um, the the Hate Street tour, it was very successful in a lot of ways. One was because of uh, the um, the social distancing aspect of it actually made it more possible for us to have smaller audiences. And we're, our plan is to continue the tours for six months a year. So it may not happen in 2022, but we have a plan for it to happen in 2023 um, for that particular tour to happen again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Well, the um, I mean, the tours themselves um, really focus on San Francisco histories, but but definitely um, many of our histories are are about immigrant histories. So in that way, the Out of Sight tour definitely um, talks about those histories. Other works that that I've created have dealt with other histories like Bulgarian queer history, Brazilian queer history, for example, are two that I can think of. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So I'd say, uh, you know, that really played a very big role in the North Beach tour because we were talking about um, especially Japanese immigrants um, with the history of Yoni Noguchi. Um, and this writer, Charles Warren Stoddard, and, and also the oppressive laws that exist with, um, that existed at the time around Asian Americans and keep keeping people, you know, in very particular um, neighborhoods and being fined if you left that neighborhood. Are right okay. So yeah. Um, and I just want to, I mean, it's like really so rich. And I just kind of want to frame some questions to see to think about, you know, in the arc of our investigation in the semester. And I think one interesting question is, you know, we've been talking a lot about history, and representing history, and interpretation. How does this relate to maturity? How does this? plug into what cities become. And concretely, you know, in terms uh, just in, for example, in the planning processes, it was a planning process that had gone astray as a co-author research industry that then became really inspirational for the craft. And then what is the interaction between that critical planning Yeah. 
Somewhat. I mean, I mean, get you know, getting involved with having partnerships in each of the neighborhoods. Um, we just have partnerships with different organizations and neighbors and uh, businesses, and uh, some of the cultural districts that have developed out of um, Shane and Donna's study. Uh, you know that that actually I think is a direct connection between the now cultural districts that are. So there's now, like for example, the this the LGBTQ and leather cultural district South Market. Uh, we work very closely with them uh, to help them uh, work with some of the histories that, that they want to sort of confirm. So we influence that, and we also work with them on a potential app-based uh, walking tour. So. So whether that deals with, I think that deals with the future because essentially it's like you could, if you couldn't make it to a walking tour or, or to one of our moving tours in the city, you could at least find the information on a, on a web base. So yeah, I mean, it's a really good question because there, the, I think that my answer also is like getting involved with the organizations that are, making plans for the future around the preservation of the histories and being really involved in those those plans in each of the neighborhoods yeah so yeah um like this building um for example the Dean and larson building where we had our residency this past year it's connected to san francisco heritage and they're very much interested in preserving histories and the future and and how we help them in live in the spaces. Thank you.